Okay. <laughs> we have a real microphone this time. There's no excuses for not being heard tonight. Welcome to the fifth uh, Why There Are Words series. I do this quarterly, and Why There Are Words is actually a national neighborhood of writers that uh, have readings in about five different cities. There's LA, New York, Portland, Pittsburgh, Austin, um, and I think it's just starting in Chicago as well. So this was something that was started by a Warren Wilson MFA graduate, Peg Alford Purcell, who read here last time. And she also started a small press and wanted to have uh, uh, a circuit, so to speak, or what I would call an underground railroad, you know, to have writers who have new works or that she is publishing herself. She's doing two books per year to be able to have places for them to go and uh, share their work. So this is how we do it in Austin. Um, the original series in Sausalito where I read, and I think Kendra also read, you have eight readers who have eight minutes each. I don't do that. I mean, I wouldn't do that to you. So we have four readers and we have, you know, 15 to 20 minutes. So, um, it, and I always, because this is Austin, want to have one songwriter each time because that is another part of writing that um, most bookstores and reading series don't acknowledge. So I want to say also that uh, the Chronicle got it wrong, but it's an interesting twist. They had it listed as, why are there words? <laughs> <laughs> and I, it's, it's why there are words. One is one is. So I, I think we'll be able to decide by the end of the night why it is that, that, that we have these words. So I'm really excited to have the readers tonight. Uh, I was a Dobie Paisano Fellow in 2007. Michael Adams is here from UT, and he uh, um, heads that program. And he suggested uh, Domingo Martinez to me, and I couldn't believe he said yes. So I mean, we dragged him away from J. Frank Dobie's ranch to come here and be with us tonight. <laughs> And uh, just want to tell you a little bit about him, and he'll speak for himself. He's a New York Times best-selling author of The Boy Kings of Texas, which is a memoir, and was a finalist for the National Book Award in 2012, gold medal winner of the Independent Publishers Book Award, and nonfiction finalist for Washington State Book Awards. That's because he lives in Seattle. Wednesday. When he's not in Texas. But you were born and raised in Brownsville. Okay. Uh, Pushcart Prizes. Uh, Salma Hayek is putting together an HBO series based on the Boy Kings of Texas, which I'm sure we will get to see one of these days. Also, he's got a, a sequel to the memoir called My Heart is a Drunken Compass. And I have no idea what he's going to read tonight. We will all be surprised. So please welcome Domingo Martinez. Thank you for that. Um, actually, a small correction, um, the HBO project went kaput, oh. um, but it got picked up by NBC, so we're working on that. It, but instead of being a dramatic comedy, a dramedy, it's going to be more of a comedy. So <clears throat> hopefully that'll move along. Um, so the theme was smoke and mirrors, and I took that a little bit too literally because I was thinking we're talking about class A drugs. <laughs> yeah, I worked on that one for a while. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to be reading uh, something that I read for This American Life, uh, which I think comes in just under the 15 minutes, and is uh, one of the chapters in The Boy Kings of Texas. And it's about uh, sort of my misspent youth uh, when I was supposed to be going to high school. I was doing other things. And uh, so it's called Delta City Repeat. <clears throat> By the time I was 16, at a sophomore in high school, my foremost ambition was to get clear away from it before 9 a.m. Not consciously, of course, not for the first few hundred times. School, I had noticed, was considered my time, which meant I couldn't be pressed into labor by my farm-working father or grandfa grandmother for fear of government involvement. 
so I learned to take advantage of this. Either by school bus or by my mother's Taurus, I make it to school before 7.30 a.m. and wait out options for escape. By my sophomore year, Tony Garza had become my principal friend, or veteran pimp. You remember Tony. <laughs> he was, by this point, a grizzled imitation of the artful Dodger, but with good parents and, even, and an even better little brother who was about to lap Tony at high school graduation. Together, Tony and I would find ways to while away the hours by doing anything other than attending class before we had to report home again. We were big fans of Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, and I think we even tried believing we were continuing the long-celebrated American tradition by ditching class and getting stoned, a fantasy combination of Mark Twain by way of Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> but in full transparency, we were just lazy and looking for a good time. The skipping itself was not a problem. I would eventually come to, <clears throat> excuse me, the skipping itself was not a problem, I would eventually come to learn. The problem was being allowed back into school when we wanted to go back. <laughs> Tony halfway convinced me that he had long ago mastered this obstacle with a bit of Bronze Age technology. Admittedly, I never did question why he was still held back all this time if his chicanery was so foolproof. But to his credit, Tony actually initiated me into the trade I'd eventually pursue, which is graphic design. But, by, but in this early stage, it was just plain and simple forgery. There was no design in what we were doing. It was Tony who had placed the first X-Acto knife I ever held in my hands, and immediately I felt an overwhelming sense of possibility, holding that little pen knife. He showed me how to use the X-Acto to surgically remove and rearrange grades and absences on a, on a report card <laughs> before it got to our parents. We did intercept the report card and make our alterations, then photocopy the doctored product and slip the manufactured version into the school district's envelope to cover our trespasses, and then lay it nonchalantly on the dining room table before our parents got home from work. Tony took careful pains to explain this whole process to me, his flunky, a term that came uncomfortably close to be becoming literal, over the photocopier in the library. Fitting dimes into the machine like he was playing slots in search of a copy that didn't blur or show the incisions in the original. We were stoned and forcibly schoolbound because he couldn't get his mother's car that day. Look, man, he said through his trendy and tinted John Lennon glasses, you just got to remove the two from in front of the 23 absences, <laughs> then lighten the reproduction, and you got three absences in the first period instead of 23. <laughs> now take the eight from the 48 you got in Spanish, move the four over, and put the eight in front of it, and now you have a B instead of an F. <laughs> Oh, I said in total understanding, a big smile growing on my face, conveying just how thoroughly I understood. Give the man a ride, he skips for a day, but teach him how to forge, etc. <laughs> oh, it was ridiculously short-sighted, sure, but at that age I never thought further than the immediate threat. Simply convincing my mother that everything was quiet at school was enough for me. Dealing with school records and the larger consequences of robbing myself of even that low shelf in education, all that I would face at a later date and certainly have. That first year, Tony would usually borrow his mother's car, a blue Oldsmobile Delta 88, which was my own mother's dream car, but totally unaffordable to us, and he would use it for our expeditions. So it was with the complicated disquiet that I rode in this car on, on an almost daily basis to South Padre Island and back, a resort town at the end of a 28-mile highway that somehow felt much more cosmopolitan than Brownsville, Texas ever could, <laughs> possibly because people from all over the United States vacationed there. We drive there three or four times a day, listening to Led Zeppelin, as was Tony's unwavering musical proclivity, nodding my head in unison and in, <clears throat> excuse me, nodding my head in, in unison and in rhythm with whomever was stoned or drunk in the car. There was a revolving cast of extras, but me, Tony, Chris Arteaga were the standards. I didn't like Chris very much at the time because he reminded me far too much of myself, but I didn't know that then. Most of the other transient guys were idiots, even before they were high, so there was very little discovery or anything of interest ever said when the others were in the car. <laughs> Collectively, we just wanted to feel better than sobriety, not understanding that we were feeding what would become addictive personalities. Between Chris, Tony, and me, though, we were capable of telling good stories, appreciating smart things, and Chris had really good taste in music when he was allowed to take over the radio. Once, Tony blew us all the way up by narrating a story he made up against the wordless musical theater piece on the run from the Dark Side of the Moon album by Pink Floyd. We were high and parked the, and it, we were high then and parked at the country club. And he just stopped the car, turned up, turned up the volume, and narrated this fantasy piece he'd written while the song played on the radio, 
we were enraptured by this because we were high. I've always loved radio plays, and this was among some of the best I've ever heard. He'd never taught that all his life, sadly. My junior year and his third senior year, Tony's parents bought him a Dodge Laser. It was the year he would most assuredly graduate, they felt, and it was a chance for him to develop responsibility. The car was a dopey silver four-seater about which we would eventually become quite fond. By that year, I'd be dropped off in the front of the school as, uh, in the morning as early as possible because I was embarrassed to be seen in the, the aging Taurus. Among the poor and working class in Texas, an automobile is as telling as a tax return, and I had been taught by the Mimis, my sisters, uh, long before to pretend that one was rich and white. And a 1986 Taurus in 1990, well, that wasn't quite well to do in Brownsville. It wasn't Dallas enough. <laughs> the minute my mother disappeared around the corner, though, Tony would drive around the other corner and park right in front of the school, in front of anybody, in front of everybody to pick me up in order to carry on with our naughtiness. My man. Or perhaps, as I came to understand later, my pimp. Dude, you gotta come skipping with me today, he'd say. Nah, Tony, I gotta go back to class today, I'd say. It's Thursday and I haven't been since last week. Some days it would be the other way around. I wasn't always the bottom. Plus, by this time, I'd already been branded. Tony's company alone was enough to telegraph my ethical slips to any administrator watching, so they'd regard my documentation with suspicion. Look, I got two side re-entry slips. I can get you back tomorrow in or next week. It's not a problem. Plus, he'd say, I found a place to get killer weed, and it's pickup day, pick day in Wood Hollow. Since we didn't have jobs or an allowance, we had to figure out a way to finance our junkets, or skiving, as J.K. Rowling called it. Tony had figured out that the local grocery stores would pay back a deposit on those five-gallon plastic water bottles at six bucks a pop. He had the Oasis truck's delivery route and schedules memorized, and, and we knew escape routes out of every posh neighborhood that could afford to have water delivered. <laughs> this was actually a lot of fun, walking up to houses, hoisting the bottles over your shoulder, and walking back to the car, only to drive a few streets and do it again, utterly without chastisement because nobody was around to stop you, or would have stopped you if you waved at them and smiled. <laughs> They'd smile and wave back and continue on with what they were doing. It never failed. The challenge was to keep from giggling, stoned as we were in our trousers and cheap dressy shirts with wet stains growing down the front or the back. There were instances, of course, where we'd get caught red-handed when a door would open or a homeowner would unexpectedly emerge from the hedge. Then we'd sprint away as Tony, self-serving coward that he was, would drive off and leave us to fend for ourselves. Our dude, they could get my license plate, he'd laugh as we'd breath breathlessly catch up on the car many blocks later and curse him. He always kept the, the lion's share of the day's activities, very Dickens. Most of it would go to buying five or ten dollars worth of pot and maybe some beer, but it would never even out. And no single dealer would ever sell to him regularly. No one really liked or trusted Tony. So when he said he'd found some place to buy pot and it wasn't the morons who hung up by the tennis courts before school, well, I have to admit I was intrigued. Besides, he was a friend, somewhat, and these things could turn out badly. So I went. I wasn't really keen to own up to three days AWOL at school anyway. We first drove to the housing project east of school where a woman sold $2 quarts of Budweiser out of her living room from a cooler to anybody with money, no questions asked, and bought a couple of quarts. We smoked the last half joint Tony had on the way to his new supplier. And I was getting a little bit stoned when I began to recognize the route he was taking and was then thoroughly taken aback when he drove into my maternal grandmother's driveway. I couldn't understand why. I was kind of confused by the context. This was the same driveway my family Pontiac would regularly pull into after church on Sundays when we were growing up in the late 70s. This was my mother's mother's house in downtown Brownsville. I was, I think the term is, unnerved. My two uncles, Johnny and Abel, were working on a 79 Camaro when Tony drives up in parks, hood to hood, with the Camaro that morning. I sat frozen in the passenger seat, uncertain what to do next. The hood on the Camaro was up, and they were both leaning into the guts of the engine when we drive up, and their heads popped up like bearded biker prairie dogs to look at the new <laughs> development. Tony, taking my noticeable start into account, tells me to be cool, chill out. These guys look mean, but they're all right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he says as he's getting out the door, they're kind of dumb, but they got great weed. Didn't I know it? Abel and Johnny had a long history with the local biker gangs, even a rumored affiliation with the Hells Angels. They could get drugged, nobody else could in this town, and as a result, excuse me, they were total burnouts, hardly capable of cogent speech patterns in either English or Spanish, <laughs> landing in jail as often as other people attended church. 
Though what they lacked in brain, they certainly made up in brawn. Not that they tear apart a citizen like Tony or me, not in the daylight anyway. Not in the daylight, anyway. They had a code about that sort of thing. But if they felt cheated, they'd have taken a tire iron to my head long before they recognized me as their nephew. Or that I'd been there the week before with my mother, their sister. They were that burnt out. <laughs> so I sat there paralyzed in the front seat, side B of Houses of the Holy playing on Tony's mother's cassette deck, over the deafening blast of air conditioning, watching this terrifying pantomime playing out before me. Tony, half-shaven in his preppy clothes, closes the door and he hails his greeting. Abel, already brain dead from years of sniffing paint, narrows his eyes in suspicion at first and then noiselessly says, Hey! while opening his arm in a wide, accepting gesture, drawing Tony into their fold. Johnny looks up from under the hood of the Camaro. Next is the sly, silent exchange of the malefactor. Tony, looking servile, trying to charm, averting his eyes, looking anywhere but directly at Abel in the eye for fear that Abel might charge like a gorilla. Abel is then suspicious, cautious, a quick upward jetting of the chin says, did I sell to you before? Who told you I got weed? Tony lowering his head in quiet confidence, talking to Abel, then including Johnny, Johnny nodding his head, then motioning towards me in the car with his chin. Then they're all looking at me. Oh. My eyes are wide. <laughs> I have a big smile on my face. I'm nodding. Tony says something. They all laugh together. Led Zeppelin playing loudly in the car. Abel slapping Tony on the back and leading him around the back of the car. Johnny's looking at me and smiling making his index finger and thumb into the mock roach smoke and laughing. <laughs> me mimicking him back. Him not even recognizing me even now. Tony and Abel coming around the other side of the car with Tony's hand in his pocket, both of them laughing like they're suddenly old friends. Tony turns and he waves. <clears throat> both Johnny and Abel wave back. The door opens and Tony says, dude, we got a big toy for two bucks, as he gets in the driver's seat. He puts the car into gear as we drive away. This has freaked me out to no end. Abel and Johnny are both waving, making the universal road smoking sign as we drive off. <laughs> and it leaves me feeling really, really conflicted. The car slipped up the southernmost term terminus of Highway 77, and we head north from urban Brownsville just to drive around as we smoke the joint. Tony lights, lights it up, and it starts burning purple. Purple haze, he says. <laughs> and then he follows it with his characteristic, ah, <laughs> making the obvious pun didn't bother him. I was concerned that the, jo the joint was burning purple. Abel and Johnny were not known for their temperance. Hey man, I say, I'm kind of scared. I'm kind of scared about smoking this. I've never seen one burn this color before. Our dude, says Tony, don't worry about it. Those guys got killer weed, man. They're like bikers or something. It's probably laced. That's why it was two bucks. This idea sounds appealing to Tony, but it freaks me out. We're both getting incredibly high. Hey man, says Tony, wouldn't it be fucked up if like, when you were high, your hair went into like a huge orange afro, and the higher you were, the bigger your afro got. You couldn't go anywhere because people would be like, man, that dude's stoned. <laughs> I'm thinking about having just bought weed from my uncles, Johnny and Abel. Johnny had been stabbed in the, stabbed in the back with a flat-headed screwdriver about a month earlier in a street fight. His lung, has been his lung had been punctured, and my grandmother said you could hear whistling every time he inhaled. He wouldn't go to the hospital to get it treated for three days. <clears throat> We're halfway done with the joint when, when I realized we're not headed south again, having turned around somewhere. Hey, man, I say to Tony, I don't want to get stoned anymore. R, well, put it out, says Tony. He's nodding his head back and forth to Zeppelin. Tony fancies himself a guitarist. His left hand is fingering cords into the neck of an imaginary guitar, and I watch his fingers moving for a few seconds, suspended and twisting around there like an overturned king, cat, king crab, and I can find no concurrence with the chords in the song. Man, I mean, I don't want to smoke pot anymore, I say to him. I don't want to skip school anymore. I want to go back to school. Not today, but like in general. <laughs> I don't want to feel like this anymore. Like I'm doing something bad. I feel like this all the time now. Dirty. Look at that really fucking small house over there. We were on an overpass and I just noticed the house beneath us in Brownsville Country Club about a quarter of the size of the houses surrounding them. Tony finds this segue in my announcement hysterical. He starts laughing so hard that I have to make him focus back on the driving, but then I laugh right along with him. You're stoned, he tells me. Yeah, I agree, I'm way stoned. Hey man, I say a little later, we're driving back to South Padre Island now. You know those guys we bought weed from today earlier? Weed from earlier today? The bikers, he says. 
That was my grandmother's house, man. Those are my uncles. I see. Tony finds this befuddling. He can't figure out what the bikers were doing at my grandmother's house. <laughs> Those dudes were my mom's brothers, man, I explain. My uncles. Tony's laughing so hard he has to pull over to the side of the road. His laughing is infectious and I find myself laughing right along with him. Laughing harder than I have laughed in a really, really long time. But I'm feeling really, I'm feeling utterly beyond redemption on the inside. Like I'd just done something today that I couldn't take back. Like my course had now been set. Yeah.